John Wick is back, looking for a way out of the criminal underworld in John Wick Chapter 4, and Winnie the Pooh and Piglet go on a violent, murderous rampage in Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. All this and more is out this weekend. Hello guys, I am the Hick Critic here bringing you my opinions of recently released films. So, first, a few housekeeping stuff before we get started. There's going to be a little bit of a change in the format of how this show works, at least for the foreseeable future. For starters, I'm not going to bust myself trying to track down every single movie that comes out in any given weekend. While I will always give you reviews of the big releases when they come out, for the smaller ones, I'm not going to make them my top priority, at least for the time being. Instead, what I might do is give reviews of recent films that maybe I missed or slipped under the radar. Maybe give those movies a day in the spotlight. And while we're on the subject, I'm also not going to write more in-depth, longer reviews of the smaller films. Instead, I'm just going to focus on writing a quick one to two minute review of what I thought of it, just enough so that you're able to ascertain what's out, what it's about, and what I thought of it. I'm also not going to stress about getting exactly five reviews out either. It might be less than five, or it could even be more than five, depending on what I saw in the previous week, and depending on how much actually came out. This is going to take a little bit of experimentation, so please bear with me as I try to work this out. Thank you for your patience, and now let's dive into the reviews for this week. You and I left a good life behind a long time ago, my friend. John Wick Chapter 4 is the latest installment in the popular action franchise. John Wick, played once again by Keanu Reeves, has returned. And, once again, he is working to fight for his freedom, but he now faces a new foe, the Marquis de Gremont, played by Bill Skarsgård, who, at the request of the High Table, is willing to use any and every tool at his disposal to bring Wick down for good, including turning old friends into enemies. One of the things this series has been consistently fantastic at is providing nerve-pounding, exciting, and brutal fight set pieces that put the V in violence. It seems with each and every film, everyone seems more than willing to up their game to try to provide some excellently choreographed fight scenes. And, yeah, obviously this is no exception. In a standout sequence that might actually stand as the greatest set piece in the entire franchise to date, and that is saying something, we are treated to a two-minute scene showcasing John taking on hordes and hordes of baddies from a bird's eye perspective. It is a visual feast and allows us, in a way that hasn't really been done up to this point, to simultaneously soak in the mayhem and carnage on screen and disassociating ourselves from it as well. It's an incredible piece in which the director, the camera crew, the stuntman, and the choreographers all deserve all the praise that they get for it. While there's not quite as many fight scenes in here as you would think, the film more than makes up for it by stretching them to their absolute breaking point, and then providing gaps in between to give the audience a rest. It is for this reason that the film is over two and a half hours long. But thankfully, even for a film as long as this one, the pacing is sparse. It's always on the move and keeps the story flowing with good momentum. If anything, I actually kind of feel like there were times where the story moved a hair too quickly, and it probably needed a little bit extra time, but that's largely a nitpick. And like the other John Wick films, there is this exploration of the kind of man that John is. If he does somehow manage to earn his freedom, what would he even do with it? Is killing all that he really has left? Does that make him more of a man or a monster? Not necessarily the deepest themes in the world, but they handle them rather well. And then this film also continues and adds on to the world building that was established in the previous films. And the more we spend time in this world, the more we realize just how pervasive the criminal world really is. Watching people get shot and get run over by cars is just a common everyday occurrence for the regular citizens here. And yeah, it's always fun to watch the typical John Wick tropes in full swing. The bad guys that can't hit John even when they should. John Wick surviving hits and falls so bad that you wonder if he's an actual literal god. And the morons in the underworld who haven't figured out 
that maybe trying to go after John Wick for a quick payday isn't worth your life. In fact, this one adds an extra twist on top of that with one character who actually does take part in killing some of the assassins that are trying to get John because, hey, he wants that reward money for himself and he's not going to get it if they're the ones that kill him. That one detail alone actually gives this a bit more of a level of realism to the world that they've created and provides some character to one of our ordinarily faceless mooks whose sole existence in these films is to be cannon fodder. And some of the scenarios that the characters find themselves in are rather interesting. How they're essentially pawns being used by the high table and are forced to turn on and be pitted against the friends. It creates this ambiguity of the motivations between the characters that yeah, we've seen explored before in this franchise, but never like this, at least not to this degree. Bill Skarsgård as the main villain is good. He's a more than passable, competently written villain, although I'm not really sure why people are saying that he's the best villain of this franchise. I mean, he does a good job at playing a twerp that you want to smack across the face, but I don't think he really carries himself in a way that a villain that yields this much power should have. I'm just not convinced that he would be able to persuade the high table to give him every single resource at their disposal. And I guess I can use this opportunity to segue into some of my issues with this film. I see a lot of people declaring this to be an action masterpiece and the best of the John Wick franchise, but... I don't agree. This is the first John Wick film where I actually have some serious concerns. For once, the writing was a problem for me. Not problems big enough to sink the film that much, but enough that it gave me some genuine pause. Probably my largest complaint with this film was the ending. Not necessarily what happened, but the way it happened. It just didn't feel right, like the film wasn't really trying to build up to its own conclusion which was exasperated by its limp-listed refusal to actually commit fully to its own payoff. And I know precisely why they did it this way, but still, it just wasn't handled in a way that I felt was satisfactory. And to be honest, that's not the film's only problem when it comes to writing either. The film basically tries to act like the last five minutes of John Wick 3 just didn't happen. I mean, it's not like it ignores it entirely, but with the cliffhanger that the last film ended on, I thought this film was going to go in a certain direction, and aside from one scene, it just frustratingly doesn't. Instead, it basically retreads the ground of the third film, wherein John tries to earn his freedom, just, you know, using a different method. And because of that, assuming they don't have plans for a fifth film, you could theoretically skip the third film and not miss much of anything. In fact, skipping the third film would probably make this film even better, because it would make certain character decisions a lot easier to swallow which sucks because the third one is actually my favorite of the franchise. This is the film where it was most obvious that they didn't really have much of a plan beyond a single film at a time. They clearly didn't know what to do with what they set up for themselves, so they decided to backtrack as quickly as they could. And while not a huge complaint, this is still a distraction that I think needs to be addressed. This contains some of the worst written bits of dialogue in the entire franchise. Now, dialogue has never been a strong suit of this franchise, that it didn't really need to be, but it was passable. Here, though, some of the lines were so poorly written, I actually stopped and thought to myself, did they really just say that? So, yeah, I would say this is easily, and I do mean easily, the weakest of the series so far. But keep in mind, the weakest in a franchise as strong as this is still really good. I mean, what am I supposed to say? Tell people not to go see this? These beautiful, dazzling set pieces, the gorgeous kinetic violence, and the impressive stunt work, especially if they're fans of this franchise, that's just not going to happen. It delivers precisely where it matters the most. And yeah, while I do wish the writing for this was more up to snuff, and I was frustrated with its refusal to commit with what its previous entry had set up, I did have myself a good time. The 2 hour and 40 minute runtime just flies by. This contains some of the best action you will see in the cinema all year, and that alone is worth the price of admission. John Wick Chapter 4 gets a full shot. You should be close now. We're not going to find them. We will. Pooh, Piglet, Eeyore, we were friends for many years. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. I just now got around to watching this, and... Well, it is headed into home release in the next two weeks, so I figured, why not check this out? Actually, now that I've actually seen the final product, I can think of several reasons why not, because this is a piece of poop. Now, 
before I actually get into the review, some of you might be wondering, really, is Disney that desperate for money that they would release a Winnie the Pooh slasher film? But actually, this is not Disney's fault this time. Because the original A.A. A. Milne characters entered the public domain last year, now anybody can use the characters from the original books, assuming they don't borrow too much from Disney's iteration of the characters. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into this. As a young boy, Christopher Robin has many grand adventures with the animals in the Hundred Acre Wood. However, when he heads off to college, the animals feel abandoned. Years later, Christopher Robin returns only to find they're no longer the cute, cuddly animals he remembers. They're now crazed, psychotic monsters who kill indiscriminately anyone who crosses their path. You know, this really shouldn't be that hard. All you had to do was make something campy, something that's self-aware enough to know what it is, not apologize for it, and integrate Winnie the Pooh iconography into the kills. And there are hints of inspiration in here at times. Pooh whipping Christopher Robin with Eeyore's tail, Pooh pouring honey all over his next murder victim, but those moments are few and far between. If there were moments like this all throughout the film, you could at least make the argument that this film had a sense of humor about itself. But the film takes itself so seriously, and more often than not relishes in its ugliness to the point of becoming unpleasant to sit through. This is not helped by the fact that the film is a visual eyesore. Everything about the production design is cheap, the cinematography is horrid, the direction is crap. For some reason, they thought it was a good idea to convey a chase scene with shaky cam in a desperate attempt to make the scene more intense. The lighting in this film is so bad that some scenes are borderline incomprehensible, which I think is by design to try to disguise the fact that the film doesn't know how to properly stage kill scenes. And the costume work is atrocious. It's literally just two giant guys wearing rubber masks, and sometimes the mask will move in such a way that you can tell that they're wearing rubber masks. It is horrible. Oh, and don't even get me started on the victims. Most of the characters in this film are total non-entities. Their sole existence in this film is to be a meatbag that gets killed. None of them have a single personality trait that makes them interesting or likable or stand out at all. And unfortunately, we get to spend most of the movie watching these poorly acted people that we don't care about either make dumb decisions that get them killed or just not doing much of anything. The only remotely interesting character in this mess is Nikolai Leon's performance as Christopher Robin. While he does still occasionally give a bad read, and some of his lines are genuinely atrocious, during some scenes, you can tell that he is actually trying. You can hear the utter heartbreak in his voice after the animals that he thought were his childhood friends actually turned out to be monsters. And he honestly puts in way more effort than this movie deserves. And the times where he does give a bad read, I would probably blame that on the fact that I would assume most of this film was made up of single-take scenes. I mean, this movie was shot in just 10 days. So they were probably pretty rushed for parts of it. Look, I really can't get too angry at this because, to be honest, my expectations were already rock bottom. It's maybe for that reason that I didn't quite hate this as much as everyone else. Oh, don't get me wrong, this is still horrendous, but it does have a few not terrible things worth highlighting. The opening backstory conveyed via illustrations was actually alright. The opening set piece with Christopher Robin and his fiance first coming across Pooh and Piglet was done passably for the most part, and like I said, occasionally this film will work in something that, handled with a different tone, could have been seen as creative. But yeah, those faint praises are hollow in comparison to all the other awfulness you have to endure in order to get to it. Do you want my honest opinion? If you're that sickly curious and you just have to see it, just watch the first 15 minutes. Once the opening title card comes up, turn the movie off, because that's where it peaks. Ultimately, this film never really rises above exploitation. It's a film that was made solely to cash in on a popular IP, finally entering the public domain, and using that as a point of shock value to get people to talk about it. Well, congratulations, you did it. You ended up making a movie that earned over $4 million in almost pure profit, and you didn't even have to make it good. I hope you're proud of yourself, and I hope you're proud of this rating that I am about to give it. 
Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey gets an empty shot. And now here's some snapshot reviews of what else was released this week. Furies is a Vietnamese film that tells the story of a mysterious woman who takes young women under her wing and turns them into killing machines in order to take down a criminal empire that takes advantage of other more vulnerable women. The premise sounds like it could have been your typical female revenge flick, right down to including male villains who are so misogynistic that the idea that women could possibly hurt them in any way makes them laugh. But a few things do hold this back. For starters, the film's sheer nastiness could easily be seen as an obstacle for the people that might actually be interested in this kind of story. This film is really unafraid to linger on horrific scenes of S.A. And unfortunately for a film that wallows in its own misery, the presentation of things like the staging, the characters, and the big reveals are all just flat. But maybe if all you're looking for is some decent action scenes, you'll probably get your fill here. I mean, we're not talking about anything great here, but the actual stunt work and choreography is passable at the bare minimum. However, the one thing that does stand out about the action scenes is that they're all tinged in a neon glow, which was cool for about five seconds until they started making my eyes sting. By the end of the film, I was exhausted from just looking at the film. Not completely terrible, because I can't really say I was that bored or annoyed by it, but I'd be lying if I said that I enjoyed this either. Furies gets a half-empty shot. Chor Nikal Kebaga, or The Thief Ran Away, is a Hindi film that tells the story of a planned heist on an airplane that goes horribly wrong when that same plane is hijacked by a group of terrorists. By the way, this is another film that's predicted on big surprises, twists, and turns, so you'll forgive me if I describe this as vaguely as humanly possible. I had to admit, I really liked the idea for this film. The premise was one of the reasons I actually decided to give this a watch. It had the potential to be something that was exciting, thrilling, or even just plain old fun. But unfortunately, a good film isn't just good based on a good idea. More important is the execution of said idea. And unfortunately, said execution here is pretty poor. Not only is the acting in this appallingly terrible, but this film is contingent on a series of coincidences that only happen because certain things happen in a certain way. And yeah, I have to admit that some of this did take me by surprise. It's actually probably the only genuinely good thing about this film. However, with this unpredictability comes a cost. And the cost is that the twists that make the events unfold feel so ridiculous. Now, maybe it's because I'm an American, so I know how seriously we would take a commercial hijacking of this nature. But this film kind of treats it as something that, I mean, yeah, it's a big deal, but it's not that big of a deal. Nothing about this scenario feels the least bit believable. The hijackers are never threatening. They have the look and feel of a bunch of high schoolers trying to rob a convenience store for the first time. This film's structure is a complete mess. Seemingly taking inspiration from the likes of Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs, the story is told completely out of order. Now, given what the film's reveals are, structuring the film like this actually does make some logical sense. Unfortunately, whoever cut this film together didn't actually know how to do it properly. Sometimes the jumping around makes scenes feel choppy. Sometimes it ends up revealing something too early that really would have benefited from keeping it a secret longer. And sometimes it's paced so poorly that it holds on things much longer than it needs to. This is a movie that's nearly two hours long and it could have easily told the same story in an hour and a half. This thing is seriously padded. Overall, this movie is just patently absurd and not in a fun way. I don't buy these sudden shifts in characterization, I don't buy these laughable twists, and I don't buy any of these performances. Which is a real shame. I was genuinely hoping that maybe this could have been a decent time waster at the very least. But no dice. Shor Nakai Kibaga gets an empty shot. And now here's a quick recap of what I thought of the films reviewed this weekend. A full shot for John Wick Chapter 4. While I do consider this the weakest in the franchise so far, I also can't deny that its stunning action scenes and gorgeous cinematography complement its decently compelling plot. The film is currently in wide release. An empty shot for Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, a cynical, ugly, and artless piece of work that might actually make you think twice about supporting the public domain. The film is set for a home video release on April 5th. A half-empty shot for Furies, a film that might satisfy people looking for a female revenge film, but it's seriously hurt by the presentation of its action scenes and its dull composition. The film is currently available for streaming on Netflix. And finally, an empty shot for Chor Nikal Kibaga, a laughably bad thriller that has an intriguing setup, but gets more ridiculous and implausible the longer it goes on. 
The film is currently available for streaming on Netflix. So, yeah, John Wick 4, unsurprisingly. Despite the complaints that I had with it, this is easily the best new film this week, and one of the best films of the year so far. If you enjoyed the previous entries in this franchise, this is not one that you can afford to miss. And remember, if you want to see my early thoughts of any film I watch or to read more of my reviews, make sure to check out my Letterboxd account. The link is in the description below. That's it for this week. Next time, Chris Pine, Michelle Rodriguez, Justice Smith, and others go on an epic quest in Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves. Make sure that you're subscribed so that you don't miss any upcoming episodes. Have a good day, and I'll see you next weekend.